before looking at what a cohabitation agreement is, it may be helpful to understand what the current law is when people who live together without being married. It may come as a surprise to some, but people who live together, who we call cohabitants, do not have the same rights as married people. Those people who live together should therefore be aware that they acquire no common law marriage rights in this country simply by living together for a long period of time. The idea of being a common law husband or wife is a myth, and this can cause difficulties down the line where people are not aware of this. Based on the current law in England and Wales, cohabitants currently have no automatic entitlement to financial support or a share of the property or any of the other assets by simply living together for a particular length of time. This means that cohabitants have very limited options if they were to separate, and the options they do have can be time consuming and costly. Firstly, there is no right to the equivalent of spousal maintenance or a share of the pensions. And property issues will most likely be dealt with under property law, so this will usually depend on who owns the property and who paid for the mortgage and or deposit. Without wishing to go into any detail, there may be other ways in which a cohabitant can make a claim on a property if they're not a legal owner. For example, in certain cases, cohabitants may be able to establish a beneficial interest in a property. If, for example, they were able to show that they contributed to the purchase of the property and or any renovations, or if there was an agreement that they should have a beneficial interest in the property and they acted to their detriment in reliance on this common intention, or, for example, if the legal owner of the property led them to believe that they have a beneficial interest in the property and they acted to their detriment as a result. These types of cases can, however, be tricky to prove and expensive. If the parties have any children together, there are options to provide financial provision for those children. However, any claim relates to the needs of the child and the options can therefore be limited, especially in modest money cases. Many family lawyers will therefore agree with me when I say that the current law for cohabitants is not exactly fit for purpose. You should be aware that there's already a House of Commons committee report which has set out recommendations to the government. However, it could take years for any changes to be made, if at all. It therefore remains to be seen what the future will be regarding the rights of cohabitants. However, based on current law, there are limited options, particularly, as I say, in more modest money cases, and cohabitants may find it difficult to know for certain where they stand. So, what is a cohabitation agreement? A cohabitation agreement is a document entered into by an unmarried couple who either already live together or intend to. Its primary objective is to regulate how property and other assets should be dealt with if they separate in future. It can also regulate financial obligations if a couple co-own a property, such as who will pay the mortgage, who will pay the other bills and in what proportion. In addition, the agreement can help document the division of ownership in a property at the time of cohabitation and in the future. By entering into a cohabitation agreement, both parties will have the opportunity to discuss how their finances will be dealt with during the cohabitation and what would happen if they were to separate. And this can often reduce potential issues in future and help both parties appreciate from the outset where they stand. So who would want a cohabitation agreement? People who have been divorced in the past often say to me that they will never get married again. However, if you plan on moving in with someone and you have assets you're looking to protect, it may well be advisable to enter into a cohabitation agreement so you and your partner know where you each stand if you were to separate. This is particularly important if you're planning to invite your partner to move into a property you already own and you want to protect your interest. The cohabitation agreement may be worded in such a way as to make it clear what the intentions of both parties are in respect of the beneficial ownership of that property. Cohabitation agreements can therefore be particularly useful if you and your partner have each already built up assets separately prior to the relationship or one or both of you may already have children from a previous relationship or together. So it would be helpful to agree in advance what would happen to their home in the event you are to separate. You could also benefit from having a cohabitation agreement if you have no intention of getting married in the foreseeable future, but you want to buy or have already bought a property together with your partner. In addition to having a declaration of trust, as I say, it can also be helpful to have a cohabitation agreement if, for example, you've been gifted a large sum of money from parents in order to purchase a property that you'd like to protect. Cohabitation agreements can also record practical agreements, such as how the bills will be paid and what will happen to the property if you were to separate. For example, it could be agreed that if you were to separate, one party would buy out the other person's share of that property, 
or you could agree that the property will be sold and also the time frame for dealing with this. Cohabitation agreements can also be useful if you want to record how the bills are being paid or will be paid, what contributions are being made or will be made, and what should happen to those payments if you were to separate. If you want clarity on who owns what, for example furniture or a car or artwork, to avoid future complications, then a cohabitation agreement can also be useful to record this. This could be things you each brought into the relationship, or you may have purchased them together during the relationship, or were gifted them. If there are any jointly purchased items, you may want to agree a mechanism for dealing with these in the event of a separation. Will they need to be sold and divided in the proportions you each paid? Or are there particular things each party wants to keep in the future? For example, if you purchase a car together, you could say in a cohabitation agreement what would happen to it. Another important thing to think about is if you have or intend to have any pets together. You may have heard of pupnups, which parties can enter into prior to marriage. Similarly, cohabitation agreements can record things like who will pay for pet insurance, who will pay for the vet's bills, and what will happen to those pets if you were to separate. Like prenuptial agreements, to give cohabitation agreements the best chance of being upheld, it should be prepared properly. Each party should take independent legal advice from their own solicitors, and there should be financial disclosure of all their assets, income and liabilities in advance of entering into the agreement. The agreement should also be worded carefully, particularly when recording the intentions of both parties in respect of the beneficial ownership of a particular property. This can be tricky to navigate, so if you are therefore living with someone or intend to live with someone, the specialist family lawyers here at BDB Pittman's would be happy to discuss your requirements to see how we can help. Mm -hmm.